So I would like to say uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And I imagine a nearly full conference room now. We are some 50 people in there and it's fantastic that we can gather again, even if it is virtually. So uh, I am Billy Josephson, LFV Sweden, the navigation service provider. And I welcome you to this uh, session on the UTM U-Space uh, uh, session. And we have uh, two papers to present uh, in, this, um, in this session. And uh, I also like to emphasize on this, that we're using the Q&A to put questions and you can start immediately if you have already questions because you read a paper or when you hear the presenters. Uh, so please write in the Q&A and I will uh, try to pick up uh, most of them or put them together so we can uh, get all the information uh, we need out of these experts. Uh, so the first presenter is uh, Maxim Egrob and uh, he's the head of simulation at Airbus UTM and he leads the development, research and productivization of simulation of unmanned traffic management. And before joining Airbus, he was a graduate student at Stanford uh, Intelligent Systems Lab, where he developed uh, novel deep learning and reinforcement learning approaches for autonomy problems in aviation. This sounds very helpful for uh, the UAM and AAM work. So I would like to uh, give the screen to um, Max Egrob, please. Right. Let's see. Uh, Billy, can you just confirm that you can see my screen share? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, my name is Max Agarov, and uh, I'm going to be talking about evaluation of UTM strategic deconfliction through end-to-end -end simulation. Um, before I jump in, I just want to uh, briefly give a shout out to um, our wonderful collaborators on this work, um, namely uh, Sebastian Zanlongo and Tyler Young at John Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, if you're familiar with any of the ACAS SXU work, they're kind of the experts in the field and they've done a tremendous amount of work to kind of uh, make this uh, particular uh, research happen. Um, and also my two colleagues at Airbus UTM, Tony Evans um, and Scott Campbell. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, so uh, given that uh, the ATM seminar is quite generous with the time slots that uh, were given, I just want to make sure that we have a kind of an organized table of contents to keep ourselves on track. Um, I'm going to uh, first uh, start out by uh, providing some motivation uh, for the particular problem of interest, uh, namely uh, UTM, strategic deconfliction, and simulation, and why we need it in this context, why we think it's important. Um, I'll then follow by providing some background on UTM simulation and how we think about that problem um, and potential uh, implementations of it at Airbus. I'll then describe what strategic deconfliction in UTM is, um, followed by our methodology and approach to doing this evaluation problem. Uh, I'll share some of the hopefully interesting results with everybody and I conclude. So let's jump right into the motivation here. Um, so first, um, I want to try to answer the question of what is UTM? Um, so the acronym itself has many shapes, names, and forms. Um, for simplicity, I'm just going to refer to UTM as Unmanned Traffic Management, um, although there is a number of other acronyms that exist. Um, and the idea is that this is uh, essentially the traffic management system um, for uh, the next generation of vehicles in the very low airspace. Um, so essentially, the traffic management system for drones. Um, there's many variants of this. There's traffic management systems for AAM or UAM operations and um, kind of everything in between. But uh, specifically in this work, we're going to focus for 
um, the UIS use case. Um, now, uh, if you look at this uh, very loaded UTM architecture diagram, you'll see that the UTM ecosystem is composed of a number of stakeholders. Um, there's um, regulatory stakeholders, there's public safety, there's the public itself, there is perhaps um, uh, kind of all these supplementary data sources that exist in the system and complex errors that connect everything. Um, but really, uh, what I want to focus on uh, within this architecture are two key components. The first is the operator. Um, this is the US UAS operator in the green boxes. These are um, essentially the users of UTM uh, ecosystem on one side. They are the ones who want to operate uh, their UAS um, vehicles uh, to perform some operation, whether it's something like parcel delivery, inspection, um, or maybe just a hobby uh, drone flight. Um, and the other important stakeholder in this system is the UAS service supplier, um, which is kind of the entity that enables uh, the operators to enter the airspace safely and efficiently. Um, and the main uh, role of the UAS service supplier is to provide services uh, to these operators uh, that ensure safe and efficient use of the airspace. And specifically, these services are digital software services. Generally, that's how we think about them. Um, now, there's a number of these services that exist. Um, they range all the way from authorization to constraint management, demand capacity balancing, conformance monitoring, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a whole laundry list of these. Um, and these services can perform a variety of different roles. The one that we are going to focus on in this work is strategic deconfliction. So um, within the UTM ecosystem, strategic deconfliction is the service that's responsible for ensuring that operations are conflict-free prior to starting their flight. So we'll get into all of this in more detail, but I just want to provide a very quick bird's eye view of um, this, this snapshot of UTM. Um, and by the way, I should mention that, you know, in, in Europe, we would call this U space and the architecture may, may have some tweaks. Um, I will just mention that um, the analysis that we've performed and the work that we've done is generally architecture agnostic. So we're really worried less about what the underlying mechanisms for connecting everything are and really about the function of strategic deconfliction uh, within the ecosystem. So. Um, I want to briefly mention one important thing before we dive into kind of the, the meat of the work, which is that um, there are, uh, uh, because UTM is such a complex system, not only is it kind of a new paradigm within um, aviation as a whole, um, it's more digitized, more automated potentially, um, it's very uh, software uh, centric. It also brings out challenges in things like architecture and in the scale of operations that it's kind of uh, intending to enable. Um, and in order to an operationalize this type of system, we have to build trust that the system will essentially meet the desired safety requirements. And uh, at Airbus, we, we have this view of an incremental rollout of UTM. So you start out with something like UTM demonstrations on the left-hand side, um, then after uh, kind of uh, gaining confidence in those, maybe the an initial operational ETM system is deployed that has some very foundational basic services. And then um, in the long term, there's this fully operational ETM uh, that has advanced services um, and supports operations at scale and more complex operations. Um, one thing, um, that uh, we keep in mind as this system evolves over time, and it, and it already has, um, just uh, looking at the industry over the last uh, four, four or five years, is that um, as services become more complex and the system becomes more com complex, you need increasing assurance and validation and verification processes, or VNV. And we believe um, simulation is one of those key pillars on which VNV can really stand. And through which we can fulfill a lot of the uh, safety assurance functions. Um, not all, but certainly um, some critical ones. And that is kind of the gist of this work. So 
Um, I want to just briefly outline the contributions um, of our work here. Um, so we propose, uh, the first one is that we propose a simulation-based methodology for validation and verification in UTM or USpace. Um, and we address um, what I think are some key challenges in operationalizing UTM today. Um, and I'll kind of contextualize this towards the end of the talk, but really um, these have to do with quantifying the impact of system level requirements on strategic deconfliction performance and um, actually evaluating the safety benefit provided by strategic deconfliction in the form that it would look uh, 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 essentially in the UTM ecosystem. And just to make this um, kind of very concrete, um, you know, the strategic deconfliction function within this context is really looking um, uh, at deconfliction between cooperative UTM or U-space traffic. So this is UA to UA uh, deconfliction. And the objective is to essentially mitigate um, and also evaluate the collision, the UA to A, UA collision air risk. So this is, you know, not man to unmanned. Uh, this is really looking at just the participants in the ecosystem. That is the key um, for this particular um, uh, slice of the deconfliction function. So let's talk about what UTM simulation uh, is and how we think about it here at Airbus. Um, so um, I just briefly want to run through the Monte Carlo approach to UTM simulation. And I'll show you some videos in just a minute to make all of this concrete. But um, the idea is that we have uh, this UTM simulator, which really has kind of become like a platform uh, that we do a number of different things on. Um, but uh, the simulator itself is composed of two primary components. Um, the environment, which is where the vehicles, the operators, and other kind of physical entities may live, such as weather, terrain, et cetera. Um, and then the UTM services that essentially enable UTM functions in the simulation, and these include things like strategic deconfliction, volume generation, conformance monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, that laundry list uh, of services that may exist. Um, and in the Monte Carlo world, the way that we think about simulation is really we um, have some stochasticity in, in how we do simulation. So there's some uncertainty or probabilistic models that we typically configure. And so you see that as an input essentially into the simulator on the left-hand side, we have um, some, some uncertainty model that we put into the simulation and um, we let it run. Um, specifically for this work, we look at, um, let's say two um, critical types of uncertainty. The first is um, essentially the guidance and navigation error on board of a vehicle. And really this is um, looking to test the equipage capabilities of a vehicle um, really to conform to their uh, planned operation uh, in, in the system. This is where the, the type of strategic deconfliction comes in. We'll get to that in just a minute. And then we also look at stochastic demand. Uh, so randomly generated operations. Um, there's kind of two other key components that go into a simulation framework, um, at least in the way that we think about them. The requirements, uh, which could be things like conformance rate, which is essentially the absolute rate at which um, operations must conform to their plans, um, how operation volumes are created, how deconfliction is done, all these other things that are kind of part of this requirements um, uh, bucket. And then there's all these other assumptions, um, which are kind of the white elephant in the room. Uh, they are things that we really don't typically talk about explicitly, but they still need to be configured and thought about uh, because they certainly have an impact on the results. And so these are things like vehicle equipage, the operation types, demand profiles, what type of airspace allocation uh, you're using, um, all meaningful things, but maybe not the key things we're evaluating. And then on the right-hand side, we get some outputs uh, or outcomes from the simulation. And these are also probabilistic. As we run more and more simulations, we generate uh, more and more outcomes. And we kind of have this uh, probability distribution, um, which kind of captures the characteristics of all of our inputs within the simulation framework. And these are typically things like safety, efficiency, and fairness. So in this work, we'll focus specifically on safety. Um, so all in all, um, we applied this type of a framework, uh, the Monte Carlo approach to our simulations and generated about 18 million simulated flight hours. So as you see, 
to the results uh, through the results. That's just kind of to contextualize um, the uh, kind of the statistical significance of some of this work. And we can get into the details um, in the Q and A if anyone's interested. But that's about uh, how much simulation data we've generated. Um, I very briefly just want to expand on this Monte Carlo approach. Um, uh, that we think is, is kind of a, the right approach um, for essentially enabling that VNB function as UTM evolves over time. Um, really, what um, this approach allows you to do is kind of close the loop on uh, essentially evaluating um, different parts of UTM, whether they're the requirements, um, con ops, what if scenarios, um, uh, you name it, uh, depending on the fidelity models and, and uh, what your simulation can do. But the nice thing about um, this type of an approach is that you can very quickly um, iterate on different results and gain some meaningful outcomes um, as you learn about a particular requirement, service, um, et cetera, in the system with respect to these key metrics that we care about, like safety, efficiency, and fairness. And the nice thing is that over time, if the simulation um, environment is designed in the correct, in a, in a sensible way, you can also incorporate um, and cross validate against real operational data. So as uh, UTM rolls out and uh, data is generated, we can go and feed that into our simulation and continue to kind of generate these incremental and meaningful outcomes that tell us more and more about the system, uh, perhaps before they even happen in the real world. So now I just want to actually put some something real behind uh, what we're actually doing here. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is kind of a sample set of scenario simulations um, that show um, uh, what we call out and back operations. So there is a vehicle that starts out um, and flies to a, a destination and flies back. Um, so a very simple operation. You'll see that the vehicles are kind of represented by these green dots. You'll see a lot of these throughout the presentation and that they're flying in these kind of volumetric forms. These are what's known as volu uh, operation volumes. Um, you'll see that the volume that is what we call an active volume is highlighted in the video. Um, so it's kind of highlighted um, in, in a red color. Um, and these volumes are 40 entities. We'll get into those in just a little bit, but this is essentially what our simulations look like um, under, very different con uh, under a variety of different configurations. Um, there's nothing really, complicated going on here. Um, we'll get into the, the details of why we need these volumes in the first place, but really this is what happens when we run simulations. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, this is just as an example, you'll see um, the different pairwise distances over time between all the operations that are active. So you'll see that some operations get closer to one another, some get further apart, some kind of stay the same, and this changes over time. And um, this kind of pairwise distance metric is a critical component of how we measure uh, risk in the system and really try to measure the safety mitigation of something like, or the risk mitigation of something like strategic deconfliction. So it's a key part of what we are actually measuring in the sense. Um, so let's talk about strategic deconfliction. Um, so strategic deconfliction in the UTM ecosystem, as it's been uh, or, and especially in the forms that it's emerged from some of the standards and regulatory work that is currently ongoing, um, takes on this volume-based form. So what that means is operations are represented um, by operation intent volumes. Um, these are volumetric constructs that are four-dimensional. You saw examples of them in a previous video. Um, and the simplest way to think about them, and this is how we actually implement them in our simulations, is that um, if you imagine a four-dimensional trajectory, uh, which a vehicle may fly, so in our case, this is simulation, so that trajectory is fairly straightforward, it's part of our system. Um, the way that we create these volumes is we simply buffer them um, in all four dimensions. Um, so instead of a four-dimensional segment um, in your trajectory, you get a four-dimensional volume that kind of encapsulates that segment. Um, and you have horizontal buffers, vertical buffers, and time buffers to create this, um, uh, this set of volumes. Um, and once we have those volumes, they're deconflicted from one another within the system. It's as simple as that. So you see that example of two operations being side by side with one another. Uh, the volumes are free of conflict, so they um, they're assumed to be deconflicted. 
And the idea here is that um, this is done in, at plant time. So when an operator, let's say simulated operator, um, wants to do deconfliction, they'll go ahead and create these volumes and um, uh, then use those volumes to do the deconfliction. And this is the strategic deconfliction function, or um, let's say uh, the function that something like a strategic deconfliction service would try to enable. Now, um, I want to do a very brief rundown of how we actually do strategic deconfliction in this particular set of simulations. So this slide is very information packed and I think each one of the little gray boxes could probably be uh, expanded on uh, significantly, but I want to keep it short and then if there are any questions, maybe we can address them during the Q&A. But essentially, um, we make kind of a number of assumptions um, and leverage a schedule-based approach to do um, the conflict resolution part of the deconfliction. So, um, we start by assuming that we have a first requested first serve allocation in the airspace. So what that means is that um, when an operation or when an operator wants, wants to create a new operation in the system, this is kind of the blue, um, the blue operation. This is a candidate operation. Um, it will need to essentially deconflict with all the existing operations in the system. So all the operations that have been approved um, in the system. Um, that operation will need to deconflict with them. This is kind of um, the, the request and, and the deconfliction ordering that happens here. Um, there's a number of different allocations. There's kind of concepts of priority that could exist within the system. We do something very simple um, so that we can uh, get a very clean outcome at the end. Um, and essentially, once we have this type of allocation, what we do is we use the four dimensional overlaps uh, to create temporal constraints and we also create operation continuity constraints and solve a linear program. Uh, and the linear program spits out an earliest conflict free operation start time. So this tells us how to schedule the operation such that it is uh, conflict free. Uh, the nice thing about this approach, as opposed to maybe other ways of doing conflict resolution, like modifying where the operation is, or maybe um, elongating the flight track or things of that nature, is that we are always guaranteed um, to um, create conflict-free operation volumes. Um, of course, we can accumulate uh, potentially a tremendous amount of delay doing so, but the nice feature of, of doing uh, things this way is that we know that the planned operation volumes will always be conflict-free, which means that at plan time, uh, there are no conflicts in the system. So all the conflicts should come from uh, uh, you know, or if we're looking at conflicts near mid air collisions or anything that could indicate, give us a, a risk signal essentially for the system, we, uh, we know that they come from in flight activity. Um, so now let's kind of um, step back, but also see how we can apply this into evaluating risk. Um, so um, again, I'll show you uh, a little video here. Um, uh, green dots moving on the map uh, inside of operation volumes, what you'll see here um, is that uh, the, the flight tracks essentially for these operations uh, wiggle around a little bit. And that's because, as I mentioned before, we're essentially modeling uh, guidance and navigational noise in our system. Uh, these are uh, kind of wiggling tracks. Uh, the vehicles are not able to you know, track their four-dimensional uh, uh, flight track or the, the, their intended volume precisely uh, because there's noise. And um, this is what could cause the uh, flight track to actually leave its volume. Um, and this is what could cause degradations in strategic deconfliction performance. Um, so we can take kind of simulation configurations like this um, and then look at all of the pairwise distances between um, operations in these simulated scenarios. And as we do this over a long period of time, what we get is something that we call a separation distribution. Um, there's kind of a few different names for this, but essentially it's the distribution uh, of all the separation or of all the pairwise separation events in for a given configuration of the simulation. You'll see this on the right-hand side. Um, there's kind of some annotations here, but I'll skip those just in the interest of time. Um, the important thing to note is that this distribution tells you 
um, essentially how close vehicles get to one another. And through this, we can essentially uh, compute uh, some sort of an expected risk um, in the system. You know, for example, if we have um, a near midair collision threshold, we can look at this distribution and find the fraction of events that fall within that near midair collision threshold. Um, and that's essentially what we use to characterize safety in these simulations. So um, taking this one step further, um, we actually um, use the concept of risk ratios in order to characterize these, uh, uh, these safety measures. And really what a risk ratio is, at least in the way that we define them, is um, we have a definition for what we call a small NMAC. This is kind of a, a quantity that actually has a few different numerical representations, but we picked um, one that um, is 50 feet. So this, this is kind of uh, the NMAC threshold horizon. So like if you think of a sphere or kind of a pancake in the horizontal plane of 50 feet or approximately 15 meters. So when we go and look at the risk ratio, we look at the probability of a small NMAC happening given that we have strategic deconfliction divided by the probability of a small NMAC happening given that we don't have strategic deconfliction. So really what this tells you is the fraction by which um, the probability of a small NMAC is mitigated um, because of strategic deconfliction. Um, and essentially the smaller this number is, the more risk mitigation there is in the system because of strategic deconfliction. It's kind of as simple as that. Um, now, um, this does get complicated because um, um, there's other factors to consider in our simulations. I've alluded to all the different configurations that we may have, but really there's two key, what we call system level requirements here and um, uh, that, that actually have a significant impact on this risk ratio. Um, the first being conformance rate. Um, and this is actually a requirement that's emerged from kind of the, uh, the standards and regulatory world, um, essentially as a way to ensure that operations conform to their intended flight plans or their operation volumes, and then the participation rate. So I won't get into the participation um, uh, too deeply um, in the results that I'll share with you. We'll just assume a participation of, of one. And I know that Uspace also um, kind of assumes that uh, everybody is a participant in the system, so they're using these services. Uh, but we did also look at the what participation does uh, to these risk ratios. And so we really want to evaluate this risk ratio with respect to these uh, two important factors. And we also define a mid-air collision threshold, which is uh, 10 feet, so um, a 10 foot uh, sphere, essentially. Um, so I want to quickly run through our simulation configurations here. Um, so um, for kind of our first set of results, um, we, um, if you look at all the different study variables that we kind of um, cycle through, we have uh, kind of all these different variations for nominal separation, which is essentially the buffer that we use to, to kind of buffer the, our operation volumes laterally. We have um, a time buffer as well, which is essentially what we use to buffer the volumes in time. And then we have these two critical um, uncertainty configuration components, which is the standard deviation of the speed error and the standard deviation of the heading error. And you can see that they're varied between zero and 15 meters per second for the speed and zero 15 degrees for the heading. And what you're seeing in the video is essentially all the different variations, well, at least a subset of these different variations um, in some uh, kind of selected simulation scenarios. So there's kind of this uh, simulation with no noise, uh, very small buffers, um, and lots of noise, and larger buffers, and kind of everything in between. So, uh, you know, within these simulations, we actually uh, kind of take a Cartesian product of all these combinations and run a bunch of sims for each of those configurations to generate the results that we do. So, with that, um, let's uh, go ahead and look at what the results look like for these different configurations. Now, before uh, we jump into the risk ratios, I want to quickly mention um, this uh, notion of conformance rate, uh, which I introduced um, just a couple of slides ago. Um, but essentially the conformance rate is the ability uh, of the vehicle to stay conformant to its operation volume. So essentially it measures the fraction of time that a vehicle is conforming to its operation volumes. 
Um, and this is important, again, because this can dictate the quality of your strategic deconfliction or um, degrade the, the safety benefit of strategic deconfliction. So the way that we actually look at conformance rate is that we can't set it directly. Instead, what we're able to do is configure these noise values, the standard deviations for heading and speed, um, which you see on the x-axis here. Um, and then on the y-axis, you see what the actual measure conformance rate is. Um, and I've drawn uh, red lines here for a 99, 95, and 90% 90 conformance rate. So you see kind of where it intersects our curves, but the curves essentially tell you um, what the conformance rate is for a given um, set of operation volumes with these different buffer values. And this is complete just as an example uh, for you to get a sense of, of what this looks like. But, um, you know, as for larger buffers, you see that um, um, these operations can tolerate more noise before their conformance starts to degrade, let's say before it falls below um, 99%. And as we decrease the buffer size, uh, the conformance, the, the noise essentially has a more significant impact on the conformance rate uh, earlier on. So less noise um, is needed to create worse conformance. This is intuitive because if the noise values, the magnitude of them is very large, and our volumes are relatively small, the vehicle will be more likely to leave its volume. Um, and this is essentially kind of the methodology and the approach that we use to characterize a lot of the conformance characteristics in, in our simulation. So now that we have this out of the way, let's actually look at the safety analysis that we've done. So what you're seeing here is what we call a risk matrix. Um, and it shows you a bunch of risk ratios for a 95% conformance rate, that's kind of at the top. So all of the um, uh, all of the values here um, assume a 95% or better conformance rate, and um, kind of the the vertical axis shows different configurations of uh, horizontal buffers for volume. So we make the buffers on the volumes in the horizontal uh, space larger, and uh, kind of the horizontal axis is the the time buffers. So you see how this changes over time. Now we'll get into, uh, into this in more detail in the next slide, but one really important piece to keep in mind is that within each cell, there's actually many simulation configurations here. What we do to generate these risk matrices is that um, we assume that everything within each cell uh, or all the simulation configurations within each cell are at least 95% conformant. So that means we can have um, conformance rates that are 95%, um, and anything up to 100%. So we kind of have a distribution um, of conformance rates, but we know that uh, they're at least 95% conformance. So if you're talking about um, a conformance rate requirement in the system, um, all of the simulation configurations or all of the simulation scenarios would meet that requirement. Um, and the idea is that that may be representative of what real world operations may look like. Um, so now, if we go and look at what these rate risk ratios look like, across different conformance rates and across the different um, buffer uh, values for the horizontal uh, lateral dimension and for the, for the time dimension, we see some interesting results. So one thing that I'll mention really quickly is if you look at the very right-hand risk matrix uh, for the 99% conformance uh, rate, there's kind of a grayed out set of boxes. Um, this is just to say that uh, we didn't have any um, uh, 50 meter buffered uh, uh, simulation scenarios that average at least a 99% conformance rate. Um, and this is kind of an artifact of how we've set up our simulation. And I'll show you kind of an alternate version of this result. But essentially, um, there's some interesting things that you can take away from this, um, uh, from the set of risk matrices. There's kind of a lot of relationships that come to light. Um, one thing that you can see is, for example, if we look at kind of a, if we pick a cell, say um, a cell that indicates a 100 meter horizontal buffer and 10 um, second time buffer uh, here on the 90% conformance rate and kind of move across to the 95 and then the 99, we see the risk ratio decrease. That means actually um, strategic deconfliction is adding more significant risk um, uh, mitigation to our simulations. But um, you'll also see these more complex relationships happen between the risk ratio and the buffers within a given risk matrix. So what, what we see is actually that the buffers have a significant impact um, on the risk ratio. And perhaps this makes sense because this, if you have a fixed size threshold for your small NMAC, 
um, and your uh, risk uh, and your buffer sizes are fixed, um, uh, you may actually expect smaller buffer sizes to contribute or add to more, more significantly to risk. Now, we do a couple of other things here. The first being that what happens if we just look at all the non-conforming events in the system? So we kind of filter out events that are conforming that um, still resulted in small near midair collisions and only look at non-conforming events. So these are essentially events uh, where the operation has left its operation volume. Um, things become really interesting because you see kind of this um, effect on the, the buffer sizes start to wash out, especially for the 90 and the 95% conformance rate um, simulation configurations. We can actually take this one step further and use kind of that empirical conformance rate plot or tables uh, that, that we generate here to kind of characterize the conformance rate for a given set of noise configurations uh, or given set of volume buffers. And we can specifically set uh, a conformance rate um, for each of these configurations. So instead of having kind of a distribution of conformance rates in each cell, we have a single fixed conformance rate. Um, and that means when we have 90 uh, in this kind of 90% uh, conformance rate risk matrix, we actually have only 90% conformance rate simulations. And Max, when you do we're that- running late. We're running late now, Max. Uh, you have to finish ah, some feedback. Okay. Uh, it's time to finish. Please, please, finish. Uh, please finish, and we take some feedback. Sure. Um, so um, when we go and do that, we fix the conformance rate. We actually see that the uh, the buffer sizes become uh, kind of uncorrelated to the risk ratios, and really the conformance rate is the main driving factor here. Uh, so this is quite interesting, and there's a question perhaps of what's more representative and what's not. Now I want to briefly just show you. Um, what happens when we scale this up to a larger region? Um, you know, look at simulations at scale. You see here in the example video, a bunch of operations flying around. I'll just very quickly skip to the result here, but we can essentially evaluate um, this, the impact of strategic deconfliction um, at higher densities. So note this is kind of a log-log scale with Mac mid-air collisions per year on the y-axis and operations per hour on the x-axis. And we look at um, essentially the risk unmitigated um, evaluation of mid-air collisions kind of inferred. Um, and then we look at what happens when we apply strategic deconfliction. So we get a few orders of magnitude reduction. And that is a significant impact um, that we can measure at kind of higher densities here. So um, that's to say that it seems like strategic deconfliction in this setting, um, and this is under 95% conformance rate, is doing a good job. So I'll go ahead and conclude here. I just want to uh, very briefly kind of uh, point out that this work um, came about um, to address the safety need for UTM standard development, specifically the ASTM standard. So it ties very closely to what's being done there. And, um, you know, just to kind of summarize, we, we do conclude that under a proper set of system level requirements and assumptions, the UTM strategic deconfliction in the way that's emerged from the standards and the regulatory world in this volume-based construct can be a key enabler for safe drone operations. Um, I'll just very quickly say that, you know, some future work, we want to cross validate the results against operational data. We want to consider the impact of a more complex operational environment on strategic deconfliction. And we also want to look at tactical impacts on this with things like DAA. So that is all. Um, thank you. Thank you, Max, for this high density uh, presentation. <laughs> so complex and so many details. And now a lot of questions and some feedback coming in. So we try to uh, keep them quite short, but we like to address them. Anyway, yeah. the first one, uh, uh, are there factors that can make the conflict-free zones dynamic in, in real time? So changes, they can manage changes uh, during flights. Are there factors that can make the conflict free zones dynamic? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. So we didn't look at this in in, um, in this work, but actually this would be kind of a sensible follow on step to look at the impact of tactical um, um, tactical mitigation mechanisms. So I think I would say if you're making these uh, kind of changes while the vehicles are in flight, this would be kind of an additional safety or risk mitigation layer. Uh, that you could apply on top of the strategic level. So this is this work only looked at the strategic layer, mm -hmm. and certainly there's many other um, tactical components or perhaps other strategic components that you can apply 
to further mitigate risk. So we haven't looked at it in this work, but absolutely there's other things you, you can do um, to, to um, apply tactical mitigations. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, uh, how do you think these strategic deconfliction concepts uh, relate to the strategic deconfliction used in PBN routes for manned aviation? And can we apply some lessons learned from the development and the deployment of PBN? Uh, yes, this is a great question. So absolutely, um, we kind of try to ground at least some of the um, uh, uh, conformance and volume constructs in what's been done in PBM and manned aviation. So there isn't exactly a one-to-one -one mapping here because uh, the way that PBM de is defined is fairly different, but you can actually kind of recreate something similar using operation volumes. and. Um, uh, this is essentially kind of the next step um, in trying to understand the relationship here. You know, in kind of the UTM world, we have this conformance rate requirement, which essentially gives you the sigma for how far you can deviate or with, with what um, uh, fraction you can deviate um, away from your, uh, you know, let's say your planned center line, as we've done in this work. Um, and certainly there's things like right equations um, that can tell you a lot about, about the, uh, the performance of a system like this. So this is actually something that we are um, starting to look at a little bit, and um, it's a great point. So there's a lot for us to learn, um, and I think um, the ideal outcome is to try to essentially create a sensible set of parallels uh, in order to make the safety case stronger between what's been done in manned aviation and what we're kind of um, building out in UTM. Thank you very much. And we understand that there is a follow up uh, on this work and uh, you will have some homework to do with some questions will be mailed to you so uh, we can have the proper feedback uh, back and forth. Thank you, Max, for this uh, presentation and your contribution uh, to the ATM 2021. Uh, we now move over to the next uh, session. Uh, next next paper and uh, that is presented by Dr. Jan Xu and he's a lecturer at ATM CNS department within the Center for Autonomous and Cyber Physical Systems in the School of Aerospace Transport and Manufacturing at the Cranfield University and re received his PhD in aerospace science and technology from the Technical University of Catalonia and uh, a master and uh, uh, a bachelor in traffic engineering from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, and now he's in Crane Field and his uh, main research interests include air traffic flow and capacity management, ATM, UTM and urban uh, air mobility. Uh, Jiang Su, uh, I invite you to share the screen and give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Billy. Uh, I'll now share my screen. Um, it could you? Good. Oh, good. Good. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Yan Shu speaking from Cranfield University. Uh, I'm here today to present to you a uh, integrated approach for on-demand uh, dynamic capacity management surface in your space. Uh, well, you can see the presentation contains a few sections. Um, we will first quickly go through an introduction and then look into the uh, demand management, capacity management, followed by demand capacity balancing. Uh, then we will talk about how to implement the proposed approach in both a centralized way and uh, a decentralized way. Then we will use some illustrative examples to demonstrate uh, the effects uh, of the approach and the architectures. And finally, the conclusions and the future work will be given. So, um, as uh, some of you may have already been very familiar with, you know, according to the uh, use space uh, roadmap, a service of a dynamic capacity management is expected to be realized at uh, U3 uh, stage, so the use space advanced services. Uh, while the detailed definition and uh, the applicable uh, environments are still being, being developed, uh, an indicative description of this service uh, is, is uh, quoted here. Um, so I just want to highlight some uh, keywords, as you can see. Uh, like For instance, the density thresholds needs to be dynamically modified. Then uh, uh, the service may be coupled with flight planning management surface. 
and appropriate, appropriate set of rules and priorities for slot allocation when a portion of airspace is expected to reach its capacity. Apart from DCB, the service could manage capacity due to uh, uh, disruptions. Yeah. So motivated from uh, this description, this study proposes an integrated DCM approach that couples uh, the demand uh, management, capacity management, and also demand capacity financing. Um, let us uh, first look at the uh, uh, UAS flight planning management, where we have uh, taken a few points into account as, as listed here. With regard to the type of operation, uh, generally, uh, there are you know, the uh, remote pilot, uh, automated uh, for formation swarming flights. But if we check out their commonality uh, in re representing the traffic demand, we may come across uh, this, you know, the linear and area flights. Uh, specifically, linear flight uh, mean, means that a UAS travels each position for only one time, whereas uh, area flight means that uh, certain positions may be revisited by, uh, by the UAS for multiple times. Also, uh, it will be reasonable that uh, the planned trajectory should be associated with a, a buffer space due to uncertainties. Now, according to the uh, YASA opinion, the current technologies and the maturity of the youth based services and DAA uh, systems do not allow for a full integration of land and on operations. That's the creation of jaw zones uh, to, to, restrict the, 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 to restrict the access to drones is needed. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the jaw fence, uh, sometimes referred as jaw cages, uh, um, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, defined by the you know, uh, dynamic jaw fencing service, is more of like a temporal restrictions. And this study considers both, namely uh, a fixed uh, geographical areas representing jaw zones, uh, like the um, yellow surface shown here, and uh, some time varying geographical areas for short term uh, jaw fences. Uh, like the red boxes shown here. And next, it is known that today's uh, UAS technologies may involve uh, many operational uncertainties uh, that could lead to you know, un undesirable consequences like loss of data, uh, data link, loss of control, and so on. As a result, the US flight planning may include contingency plans or emergency response plans involving like uh, alternate landing sites or, or, or more complex procedures. And this paper considers the use of uh, alternate, alternate uh, landing sites. The idea is to allow the US in contingency or in emergency to land at a dedicated spot within a certain period of time. Uh, for example, in this figure, we have defined a, a, a group of available landing sites uh, like the green circles uh, that presents uh, the maximum rad radius towards uh, each landing site. And in such a case, uh, we can notice that um, uh, you know, we, 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 we cannot fly like the red line, which is the shortest pass, but instead use the blue uh, line, to send, you know, and uh, uh, similar rules apply for the uh, aero flights. Now, let us put uh, everything we mentioned before together, and we have a, a 2D airspace mapped by a set of grids, and each connected to is adjacent ones in, in eight directions. Also, we have fixed, you know, the geo zones, uh, the time varying geo fences and alternate landing sites. Then we can uh, simply generate the path for the linear flight composed of a set of sequential grids and then touch the time steps. For the area flight, we use a set of uh, vortices to define the boundary of the operation and impose at uh, the same time for all the grids within that boundary. More, this, is the, this is the initial case where there are some overloads um, obviously. And uh, if you look at the figures on the bottom, you can see that the effects of implementing centralized and decentralized are almost, are almost the same. Right? And then uh, these are the detailed numbers for both, um, for both centralized and decentralized architectures. Um, well, you can see the results are not exactly the same, but are quite close, which is not bad taking into account that the benefits we have mentioned before also, uh, the computational time can be largely reduced as well. Uh, okay, finally, uh, conclusions and future work. Um, in, uh, in, in this study, we proposed an integrated approach that couples the modules of flight planning, uh, flight planning management, 
on-demand SFS co configuration and demand capacity balancing. So basically, do they represent demand management, capacity management, and demand capacity balance? And I mean, um, uh, having this model naturally, or we could uh, deploy, uh, we, we could implement implement it in a centralized way. Uh, but there are some drawbacks. So we have also examined its uh, decentralized implement implementation methods, and it is realized through uh, the optimization model decomposition and associated solution algorithm based on column gener generation method. Um, here are some two general um, conclusions. Uh, first, the integrated approach is most promising as it achieves the best outcome if compared with other cases where some uh, functions are partially decoupled. And second, the decentralized implementation yields uh, a very high quality solution close to the global optimal as uh, if in a centralized way. Yet with reduced computational time, uh, it, it provides more uh, scalability, uh, higher uh, data privacy, and the robustness to, to communication failures. Well, of course, some open questions uh, still exist, uh, including the, for, for example, the high fidelity trajectory computation, um, and even the fundamental airspace structure. You know, um, and what about the capacity evaluation and uh, or and or prediction? and how to handle non-nominal disruptions, um, how to better process uh, the optimality gap, and if it is possible to allow a uh, asynchronized coordination scheme and so on and so forth. So, uh, well, uh, in this research, basically, we, we, we uh, solved a few um, questions and, uh, and uh, we ended up with more questions. So this is all uh, from my side. Um, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, Jan. Uh, so we uh, expect a few questions coming up from the the audience, and you ended also the presentation with a few questions on the future work. So there are a few loose ends. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, before we wait on questions, um, I can ask you then. Uh, of this last uh, last bullet point, you talked about future challengers. Uh, which one do you like to take on? Uh, in fact, I think one of the um, critical issue would be the airspace structure. Honestly, you know, the concept is is being uh, developed and implemented through quite a, a lot of uh, projects programs across the world. So. Uh, the topic itself is is kind of uh, blurring as 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 I mentioned in the presentation. So, um, and uh, uh, as you may have noticed, this is uh, really the kind of uh, 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 foundation or basis for the uh, the, the dynamic capacity management surface. So, uh, in the next step, we'll follow follow up the uh, recent. Uh, advances uh, in UTM use space development and uh, try to uh, tailor our research to this uh, to this development. Yeah. Okay, sounds sounds like an interesting. Uh, One sec. Area. So we're coming in here. Um, no questions arrived yet. Uh, when we talk about Jan uh, about uh, demand and capacity balancing, um, it, it it's already today benefit from from automation and smart algorithms, uh, and it may have potential. Uh, I'd like to hear your view on this to go uh, further on to towards full automation. Uh, do you think it's uh, feasible or or possible to reach that stage? Or if we do that, what 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 do you see? If, Kind of benefits for that. Yeah, I mean, um, um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, obviously, we are we, we aim at uh, toward that, uh, that direction uh, for automation. You know, a higher level of, of automation within their operations, and indeed, we, specifically for the DCM service. Uh, in you know, in this study, we we we, can, we we consider like the decentralized way because we understand that that that, that the. Uh, the co uh, the coordination between different actors is kind of uh, kind of a barrier to um, prevent like the automation, right? So the idea of of of, pro of pro uh, proposing the uh, um, uh, you know the coordination scheme in this in this work is that we can try to automate the algorithm um, such that we will enable 
um, you know, a higher level automation for the um, for implementing the DCM surface in the future. Yeah. That's the, 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 I would say, a good way to go. Yeah. Yes, we're moving towards that. So we also have a question here. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, how the approach you outline uh, would translate to uh, multiple USSPs operating in the same airspace? Yes, uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, in fact, we I think here we talked about this slide, right? Uh, one second. Yeah, we talked about this slide, and basically, it's a, uh, we we emphasize that it's kind of a blurring uh, as a, as as if uh, how we deviate the you know the services among different USSPs, and indeed for this study we show all the examples. Um, with a like an absolute deviation of the uh, geographic area. However, in the meantime, we allow the USSP, USSP's coverage can overlap with each, each, other, each other. So there should there won't be any uh, problem. I mean, if uh, if there are multiple uh, USSPs working in the same airspace, they have their own different shapes. Why? Because all uh, you know, um, all the associated uh, like the um, uh, the decision variables and the council and so on and so forth as are, are relevant to the USSPs itself. So uh, it really depends on how you USSP, USSP define their own airspace configuration. So um, uh, we, 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 we uh, have to uh, say that uh, um, uh, the proposed approach would definitely allow the overlap of uh, 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 multiple USSPs working uh, in the same airspace. All right, uh, and here we go. Another another question uh, uh, is also about the balance actually between centralized and decentralized. So, do you think industry partners prefer uh, one approach, centralized or decentralized? And uh, how important would these kind of preferences be in the process? Mm, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, uh, you know, from from our side, we believe that uh, um, first. The centralized uh, approach it has some advantages, but however, um, we have tried uh, to uh, to use some um, dedicated approaches to um, achieve the same uh, benefits that centralized uh, centralized uh, architecture can provide. You know, that's like the you know the optimal solution, the global optimal solution. We 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 have shown that uh, using the decentralized method can uh, achieve that goal. You know, and achieve that goal. So. And in you know, uh, and also the, using decentralized way, we have uh, uh, way much more. I would say uh, benefits like the scalability, like the data privacy, like the and and, and many um, factors. Um, and I believe that this is why probably most of the um, programs across the world, UTM programs, uh, are, are um, you know are, um, are proposing kind of uh, decentralized or federated architectures. So yeah. So personally, I would say um, uh, the decentralized way is 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 uh, is more promising than the centralized according to our 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 results. Yes, and then we have a question on on the flexibility of the work uh, for the for the generation of demand, and one of the challenges of use space is that some operations can be planned in advance, like typically inspection and so on, while others. Is difficult to plan, for instance, a pizza delivery or something. Uh, how do you think the difference in in the planning ahead of time might affect uh, the outlined DCB process? Mm. Um, yeah, it's in, indeed. I mean, I, I would say this this the um, this question is kind of relevant to the fairness issue. We had uh, when we are working on the um, uh, on this work, we have uh, had our internal discussions. How to like um, uh, enable like a, 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 a reasonable fairness criteria if it's like the first come first service or first requested first ser serviced, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, for this particular study because we uh, mainly focus on the um, uh, you know pre tactical phase or strategic phase, and um, uh, we, we uh, honestly we, we haven't taken uh, like uh, like who submits flights. 
uh, first uh, uh, and what if there is going to be like a update of the uh, flight plans into account and i believe that indeed it is a good question to to take into account in our future work mm. yeah. all right um, yeah we talked about centralized and decentralized and uh, is a question here on on the centralized management w will it be possible to get a true global optima, optimum and optimized solution that would assume that we have all flight information before and, and uh, could eliminate uncertainties. Uh, we know also that things change in, in reality. So how do you see on this? Um, well, a good, good question. Yeah. So indeed, this is one of the um, thing we need to like to improve, I would say in the in the future work that is the, about the uncertainty. Um, uh, I think as probably uh, as uh, in the, in the previous pre presentation, you know, the uncertainties may 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 come from different uh, uh, different areas. Like um, uh, for instance, in our work, the capacity the capacity uh, uh, the capacity uncertain uncertainties relevant to weather conditions and so on, and uh, 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 you know, a, a lot of different uh, events may 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 happen. You know, and um, um, uh, with regard to uh, ensuring the the uh, global optimal, um, it, it, uh, I mean, of course, uh, with a de deterministic situation, it, it 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 is guaranteed through the algorithm. You know, a, uh, of course, um, but. Having the uncertainties into account, uh, indeed, uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, the uh, optimality is going to be is going to be questionable, and of course, there are there are different um, approaches to 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 um, tackle that issue, like using stochastic programming and so on and so forth to to you know uh, in order to achieve a good solution uh, with a certain amount of uncertainties. Um, and uh, and uh, um, for the decentralized uh, for the decentralized case, uh, we are we are considering as you can see, uh, one second, uh, you can see we are considering that it, if it is possible to allow like a, a synchronized coordination scheme. That means that maybe some uh, flight plans are submitted later on. If it, some, some flights are, are, are updated, or flight plans are updated. And can we still like uh, uh, make use of this updated information to guarantee, uh, not guarantee, to achieve like a, 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 a high quality solution close to the um, theoretical global optimal as much as possible? Um, I hope I hope this answers your question. Uh, yes, there is still a minute or so if you like to have a comment or put the last question to Jan. See no more coming in. I know there is a coffee around the corner. I can smell it. Uh, so I think we uh, close uh, this session now. And thank you to Jan and Max for providing these uh, very interesting papers and outlook uh, on the current work and the future.